It had hair all over its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature, and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guessed around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot near to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, it didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Speaking with Q this evening, welcome on the uh, on the show, Q. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Now you've had you've had a number of experiences, so let's go back to the very beginning. And um, what we can do is is give me give me some information about how you sort of got into all this. How you got how what your how you got involved in the topic of Sasquatch. Um, it really begins with my great-grandparents. Growing up, I had these great-grandparents, and they would talk about these creatures called catamounts. And this would be going back to when I was, you know, like uh, about six or seven years old. And, like, growing up and stuff, we just, I know, I personally had no idea what they were really even talking about, you know. Like, because um, they would never go into a description about what a catamount was, you know. And so I used to hang out with my great grandfather a lot growing up and stuff like that. And so um, he worked; he had his own gravel company. So like I would often travel to these places that were very woodsy and just you know like really thick forests and stuff like that. And um, you know like with these catamount things, you just and not knowing what they were talking about. My grandfather, I always used to describe him as being like the most paranoid human being on planet Earth. Because, you know, when you're a kid and stuff, the first thing you want to do when you get around the forest is you want to run in the woods and play. Absolutely. And, and you don't know there's things out there that can actually get you. And, you know, not just like in terms of Bigfoot and stuff like that. But, I mean, like in my area, we have like venomous snakes. We have panthers and things like that. Sure. So, I just, I mean, like you just don't understand that there's such thing as real monsters in the forest, so to speak. But um, they passed away the summer before I had my first encounter. And it wasn't until after I had my first encounter that I realized what they were, were actually talking about. But some of the things they would talk about with these catamount creatures, um, my grandmother, for example, she said when she lived in Alabama, they would work in these bean fields. And then like in the late afternoon time, there was something come in the wood line would actually scream at them and would just be these horrifying screams. And she, like, you know, like, it was just little things that they would say that I just kind of put the connection together. Like, um, something interesting she would tell me is, like, these creatures would actually dig a hole and scream into it like a panther will do. And so oh, that's she, interesting. Yeah, and she told me that, like, they would emulate the screams of women and children crying and stuff. And she said when people would go into the woods that they would never be seen again. And she would talk about how sometimes people would go in the woods and you would just never see them again. 
Now, now let me ask you, okay. did, did they always talk about him in a, uh, a negative connotation? Always, always. And, you know, like, um, I've, I've really never heard anything positive about them, you know? Like, a lot of the stories that they were talking about were very similar to a lot of the Native American tales that you hear about. Are, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Can you? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, did you hear many Native accounts of them in that area not really um it wasn't until after my first encounter that i like i actually started really learning about bigfoot and that sort of thing and i mean just other than that i think like i just saw the same films that anybody else would have seen growing up you know between like um you know like the, you know like the 80s when i was a kid up until about the, like the very early 90s before my first encounter happened you know like like um, i always bring up boggy creek you know like growing up you know to me it was more of a comedic type movie and stuff but, you know, if you didn't know anything about Bigfoot upon watching it, you don't realize that that's what the film is actually about. And it makes one reference to, you know, like calling these creatures Bigfoot, but you just assume it's a big hairy man in the woods, you know? It's just fantasy type right. thing. Now, you're in the southern part of the country, so the terminology oftentimes is a little different than, say, in the Pacific Northwest. Mm hmm so I guess I guess that would be maybe the um, the separation point where you know you think Bigfoot. Well, that's not here. That's that's something else. Yeah, that was the biggest thing. You know, like growing up, you like you know, like I heard stories about Bigfoot and stuff, but it was always contributed to like the Northwest side of the United States and Canada. And I've never heard any stories about you know like Bigfoot growing up and stuff other than like my grandparents. But you know, like we just never understood what they were actually talking about. Because even my mom would be like, "Well, what is a catamount?" You know, and she would sure. she would just tell you, "Well, you never want to meet one." <laughs> How long ago was your first experience with one of these creatures? It was in December of um, it was ninety three, right before nineteen ninety four, and uh, my uncle had a deer camp. And what it was, I started going hunting out there, and I, I get a lot of hell because of this encounter, but. Um, you know, because of like the hunting aspect and because I fired a shot at one of these creatures and stuff, people give me a lot of grief about that. But it's one of those things where they weren't in my shoes that day to know what that was like. But it, right. it was it was basically when rifle season opened during deer season. And um, I've been going hunting for over a year and stuff. And, you know, I was like I was very familiar with the woods and stuff and a lot of the animals. And like I had basic survival skills and that sort of thing. And um I was very acquainted with like a lot of high power rifles and stuff. I wasn't allowed to use any kind of muzzle loader or anything that had black powder. But I mean like, you know, like I had people watching over me. So I was kind of supervised and stuff. So I think sometimes people get the impression that well they just gave me a gun and let me run around like Rambo, you know. <laughs> right. But <laughs> but that really That's the thing most people don't understand is that usually as young people you know, we all got some kind of training either through parents or, or other family members or or I know in Washington State we were required to go, you know, before and I can't remember the age eighteen, I think you had to go to a gun safety course that was put on by the county and get actually get a certification for that. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you're okay, man. I was just listening to you. Do you want me to go into like the first encounter? Yeah. Tell tell me what you were doing, you know, just kind of what was going on that day that led up to that situation. Okay. Like, well, when I used to go to deer camp and stuff like that, you know, I was kind of young still, and I was the younger member of the family that was going there. So generally, they kind of put me about, you know, about a mile away from camp and stuff. And I was always close enough that, like, you know, if I got bored, if I didn't see anything that particular day, I could actually walk back to camp. And, you know, I get this eerie feeling now, you know, like when I, when I think about, like, how... I finally saw those things out there and how I'd been walking the camp and walking around the woods like a dummy, you know. But um, basically what it was is there was two things that happened. I didn't get to mention this on Sasquatch Chronicles because, you know, like we were like on a time factor kind of a thing and there was a prior guest. And, you know, in one capacity, there's one incident. I can't say that it was actually Bigfoot, you know. But um, I guess two things that kind of led up to this were the year before I'd gone deer hunting and um, I actually shot my first buck. Now, what was weird about that particular incident was, um, you know, most deer, if they smell you, they run the opposite way. And right. this particular day, is I was, I was just kind of like a few feet off from a game trail and that sort of thing, and I heard a deer running through the woods. And, I, I mean, I knew it was a deer. So when the deer came across the game trail and stuff, I didn't have a clear shot at it because there were some trees and that sort of thing. So when I got like a clear shot at the deer, I took it. 
And that deer that day was actually running south. It ran over a hill and then it got out of sight and I couldn't see it. So then I had to wait on my dad to come and actually, you know, um, get me from the deer stand. You know, they would tell me, you know, don't get down from the stand, you know, until someone gets here. That was like one of the rules. Okay, so after I, we got down and stuff, we started going and looking for the deer. And we found like one drop of blood on the ground because when I shot the deer, I actually shot it in the ribs. And so it had broken one of the ribs off, but like one of the organs actually was through the hole. I'm sure that someone's listening to this like they're eating dinner like, oh, God. <laughs> But we, that's, that's okay. Yeah, but we found one drop of blood. So what was weird is, I mean, you found like snap twigs and that sort of thing, and then the trail just ended. And we were like, okay, well, where did this deer go? And it was just completely out of radar. We looked for it for 20 minutes, and we couldn't find any sign of it, no traction, nothing like that. So after we'd been looking, I had an uncle that was driving up, and he, he drives up and he says, well, are y'all missing something, you know? And I was like, you were like, yeah. And he ends up finding that deer, and though it was running south, he found it, like, just completely in a northern direction. And it was basically off one of the trails and kind of a little gully. Now, what was strange about that is that there wasn't any kind of tracks or any kind of sign of how this deer would have been, like, just placed there. It was like something had picked the deer up and actually just put it there. You know, I mean, there, I mean it was just weird. Right, right. And, you know, we couldn't wrap our head around, like, why this deer was just laying there like that. And I mean, you would just ultimately just gotten the impression that something had been waiting on the other side of that hill. And when that deer went over it, it picked the deer up. And I'm, I'm guessing that if it was a Bigfoot, what had happened was, you know, I hear that, they, like, to them, a gunshot is like a dinner bell. And I've heard about them following hunters and then basically getting, like, their, you know, like their deer or whatever they're hunting. And, and you know that's a problem with grizzlies in some regions. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing that ever happened. But we just didn't chop it up to being anything supernatural or super odd. We just said, okay, well maybe coincidentally, just this just happened. And so going into like that following summer, um, we came into this clearing. Um, what it was is we we all had like three wheelers. My uncle had a spare one we'd brought along. So I was following behind everybody else. And so we came into this clearing. And the day I would have had my first encounter, this would have been the area that my dad would have been in. And so there's like this row of little bitty trees. They're about like two or three feet tall. They're not very big at all. And I noticed that they were snapped and twisted. And I, I said to him, like, that's weird. I said, you know, why are these trees snapped and twisted like this? And it was only like, you know, like two of them at the most. And the rest of these trees that were smaller, in some cases bigger, there was nothing wrong with them. So they were like, oh, that was just caused by the storm or whatever. Okay, so then... And not knowing anything, we just wrote it off. And then, like, um, of course, my family, they just kind of joked with me about losing my deer. And I had to hear about that until deer season came along. So, like, um, it was opening season of rifle season for, you know, like deer, deer, deer hunting. And the first day I was there, I didn't see anything or anything like that. So we got back to camp, and my uncle tells me, he's like, you know, you're not going far enough out in the woods, and you're not going to see anything, you know, being this close to camp. He's like, you need to go deeper out in the woods. And um, I had like a little 22 rifle. And so he says to me, you know, you're not going to hit anything with that. And because that's what I shot the deer with before. And I mean, it really right. just didn't right. do much to it. So it's like tomorrow we're going to put you out in the deep woods. There was this, um, basically there was like a deer stand that they had that was much further away from camp. That was about seven or eight miles away. And they planted ryegrass on one side of this big, huge open field. So like the deer would come out and graze. And he's like, I'm going to let you borrow one of my rifles. And, you know, a lot of people give me grief because I can't remember what gun it was that I took out. But I'm very certain it was like a thirty odd 6 And it was something I was familiar with. They didn't give me, a, you know, like an Uzi and say, you know, here you go, boy. Go out there and, you know, have fun, you know. Okay, so the next morning we get up and I got up earlier than I normally did. Um, I went out the door and I was looking at the clock as we went out the door. It was like 4.35 a.m. So it took us a few minutes to get out to this deer stand, and um, well, my uncle had actually bought this property. I mean, it was like the Congo, so to speak, and he purchased a bulldozer. So all the trails we had, they actually had to be blazed with a bulldozer. And, um, you know, during like even the summer month and stuff, what we would do is we would go out there and blaze these trails because, you know, like the rain and stuff would erode some of the trails away. So sure, like, sure. It, was a pre it was pretty smooth trails all the way there. So uh, phone starts ringing. Oh. Good Lord. <laughs> that happens to me. I'm too. not answering it. I know it's one of my relatives, one of the few relatives I speak to. You can edit this out, right? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Gah. It's either that or my sister. <laughs> 
You know, I, I know what you're talking about. When I was a kid growing up, we had property where uh, it was all forested, and my dad had a, a co-worker friend of his that came out with a bulldozer and did the same thing, made trails out through the property, so we had access to mm -hmm. it. So okay, go ahead. the phone started or stop ringing finally. Okay, so like it, it was really it was no time getting there and stuff. And my dad had this really loud Kawasaki three wheeler, and really the reason I bring up that loud three wheeler is because that day I think the creatures probably heard us coming. Um, so like we got out there and it was no time flat, you know. So upon getting out there, it was you know pitch black. And I don't know what time it would have been. And that day I didn't have a watch on. So the thing is, I can't really tell you how much time was going by in between things or anything like that. Sure. But uh, upon getting out there, it was like pitch black. So my dad, you know, I checked my gear and he went to his stand, which was not that very far away. He was close enough to me that when he cut his three-wheeler off, you know, I could still hear it. And so I'm up in the tree, and, you know, like, I've been going into the woods my whole life. I've never had, like, that creepy feeling like, you know, oh, you're being watched. And even being a kid, you know, like when you first get out in the woods and it's really dark, you always kind of had that err uh, kind of feeling. But you kind of get over it. You get used to being in the woods and dark. But that particular morning, it was just, just something just didn't feel right. It just felt really creepy. Um... I, did, I hate this. It was like a negative kind of energy was just looming around, you know, and I just couldn't shake it, you know. I was just telling myself as a kid, you know, like, oh, I'm just paranoid, you know. So I guess it was about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer than that, after my dad dropped me off. I started hearing something banging, like a log banging against a tree that was coming from across this long field. And um, I would have been kind of like in like a tree line, so to speak. And like, so like to the left of me, it would have been like a lot of thick trees. Okay, okay I'm sorry. My, I thought that maybe the uh, internet dropped for a second there. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. I'm, I'm get absorbed into the story okay. here. So there was like a lot of thick trees and stuff around me, and there was a light breeze that day, but it wasn't anything that was blowing leaves around or anything. So like upon being in the tree line, there was a field out there that, of course, had rye grass and stuff. And so, like, the distance from, like, one field to another would have been about, you know, like, 75 yards to some, some cases were wadding out to be about a mile long. And, you know, it's, like, pitch black, and I'm hearing something go, bang, 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 bang. And, I'm you know, like, you know, I'm like, well, you know, what the hell is that, you know? And, I, you know, like, being a kid, the first thing I thought is, like, there's somebody out here doing construction work. No, it was just you and your father. Out it there, was right? just me by this time, and my dad. He would have been like a little ways away from me, so I was just completely by myself. And this was coming in a totally different direction from where your father. Yeah, was. it was on the complete opposite side of us, coming from across the field. And so, okay. like this, this wood knocking would go on, and I guess it would be about like five knocks. It was, it was never over, like say, like a half dozen or a dozen times or anything. But it, it wasn't rhythmic or anything like that. It just sounded like someone very angry was banging a log. And then I guess what was unnerving about it was how loud it was from that kind of a distance. Yeah. Okay, so then like this wood knocking stuff, it goes on, I guess, for about like 20 minutes. And sometimes the knocking, it stops for like a few moments. And then sometimes it would stop for a few minutes. So like upon the knocking stopping, you know, I mean, like I'm already getting paranoid and that sort of thing and getting kind of freaked out because... The area that we were we were in was like the deep woods. I mean, we were like about 15 miles away from like any kind of civilization. And I mean, it's like being in another world, you know. You forget there's such thing as small towns when you get out there long enough and like the city and that sort of thing. I mean, you're like in a... Absolutely. It's like yeah. a completely other realm, you know. And so like this knocking stuff goes, goes on and I started thinking, okay, well, maybe there's some people out here, um, you know, like... I was always told about people who were poachers and that sort of thing. And, you know, like we were always kind of warned about these people who, um, you know, back then there were people that would assume shoot you then had to pay some kind of fine and had their hunting privileges taken away. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. uh, you know, like out in the deep woods, you know, a lot of people think, well, the cities are dangerous. But, I mean, like, the, you know, like even the woods can be dangerous if you there's the right type of people in that area. And so like, I immediately thought, oh, wow, well, there's some people out here. Okay, so like the knocking stopped, and this, you know, this went on for about 20 minutes, you know, just kind of off and on. And um, I, like I said, the knocking's like very loud, and you, you just, you know, you got to th start thinking, okay, well, what's, what out here has two hands to be knocking besides like a human being? Sure. Okay, so like the knocking had stopped, and after quite some time had passed, you know, I kind of got comfortable again. I thought, okay, okay, well, maybe these people, they've left or something like that. 
So way, way up ahead of me, I started hearing something walking on two feet. And when I first heard it, the steps, they're not very loud. And the one thing I always forget to mention, you know, I always tell people that I thought it was a wild turkey because in essence that I did. Because the steps, when I could hear them, it was walking in leaves, but the steps were very close together. And when yeah. this, when, when like things were walking, I was hearing branches and stuff break and just like snaps and just these the snapping of fresh limbs and stuff like that. And I thought it was a wild turkey because the first year I went down there, I could actually see a wild turkey. And the bird was actually coming towards me. I didn't know it, but they were territorial. So, you know, so they'll get after Oh, yeah. You know, a lot right. of people, they, they, you know, like they underestimate a turkey, you know, and just in terms of how big they are, in terms of like a wild one versus the ones like we have for Thanksgiving, they're so much bigger. And things sound heavier than they are in the leaves. And that's the only thing I could think of that would be walking and snapping limbs and stuff like that because... Now, let me ask you, was it coming from the direction of the knocking? No, um, see, like the knocking was coming from across the field, and the thing, I call it the walker, would have actually been in front of me. And, and okay. um, the wind that day was actually blowing towards where the, the thing walking towards me was actually coming. Okay, so like the, this walker thing, um, you know, basically, you know, it, it was just like, shh, you would hear, shh, 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 walking through the leaves, and it would kind of stop for a few moments. And then sometimes it would it would kind of stop for maybe about two or three minutes, you know. And um, every time it would walk, it would be snapping like limbs and stuff like that. And so I got, you know, freaking out and thinking, oh, God, you know, there's somebody out here, you know. And then the first thing I started thinking about is, like, well, what's their intention out here, you know. Okay, so, like, um, this walking stuff's going on, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm on my own. I'm out here with someone out here and stuff. And it was just kind of puzzling because I couldn't figure out why somebody, if they were sneaking up on me, they were making so much noise, you know. And um, the steps, eventually what happens is this creature starts walking down a hill. And when it started walking down a hill, the steps just got very heavy. I mean, it sounded like a, like a really heavy human being. And, like, it just it really started making me nervous because I was hearing a much different weight than what I was hearing before. And the steps, I mean, like, as they, they started getting closer to me and stuff, I mean, I can't tell you how many yards away. It was a good distance away, but close enough I could hear it sometimes it started walking. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, I'm like, oh, God, you know. I'm, I mean, like, I was really just freaking out. And even though I had a gun and stuff like that, just being a kid, I just remember being scared. Did it ever come to mind that it might be one of these catamounts that you're – grandparents talk no about. it didn't you know it's just that was one of those things that was always in the back of my mind you know it was some like because um you know my grandparents and they got a little bit older you know i was kind of going to that preteen state to where it's like not to say i wasn't close to my grandparents but i just didn't spend as much time with them so we just didn't really talk about that sort of thing and um, as I got older and stuff, and I kind of, you know, you kind of become a little bit distanced from them, you know, like they just never really talked about that stuff. And they lived to be up in their 80s. So they lived to be pretty old. Okay, so like as the walking stuff is going on, you know, um, you know this, this stuff kind of goes on. And I, it, it was almost just like a game to some degree, like this mental, mentally torturing kind of a game. This stuff goes on and on and on. This thing stops for a few minutes and it walks. It's snapping limbs. And I couldn't make heads and tails of it. I mean, ultimately, the whole time this stuff was going on, I was thinking it was just some people around in the area. And um, the walker is probably about halfway to me, maybe a little bit closer. And I hear something behind me. Now, behind me, I would have been just like a few feet away from a trail. And there was just like this big, thick, you know, I almost call it like a Bigfoot hunting blind because where we would blaze the trails all this vegetation and like these honeysuckle vines, these big patches of like these clove leaves, it would form like these natural blinds that were like on the other side of the trail. And um, I wouldn't turn around and look, but like basically I heard something just slide in the leaves, just whoosh. And I'm like, oh God, now, you know, somebody's behind me too now. So now at this point, you've got the one individual making noise against the trees across the field. You've got another one nearby walking. Now you've got a third individual whatever behind yeah. you. And the one that was behind me, like, I mean, I could absolutely hear it moving in the brush and stuff like that. It just sounded like somebody would have been, like, sitting on their feet, and they're just more or less just inching over through, like, the brush, you know, very slowly, periodically, almost like they're sitting down and walking kind of, like, on their feet towards you. Yeah. Okay. So like the thing that's like still walking and stuff is still coming towards me. 
and eventually um, it kind of stops when it gets to like this hill that's like on the other side of me. It's just like visually I could see the hill and the creature. It would have been like on the on the other side of it, like at the bottom. So if the hill wouldn't have been there, I would have actually been able to see it. So like that one came to like a halt, and the one that's behind me is like steadily just kind of creeping up. It would kind of pause for a few moments, and then it would start just almost like kind of crawling. It sounded like it was just walking on its feet towards me. Um, about the third or fourth time that I hear it move, it actually got like this brush and started shaking at me, just shh, you know, like flushing brush at me and stuff. Right. What were the light conditions at this point? It started lightening up really well about this time. I mean, um, like when I finally saw like the creature like that was behind the tree, it was like breaking dawn. So, okay, so this was really early morning. Yeah, then, prior prior to the it day. was. I mean, it was right on dead light. I mean, the sky was blue. Um, the shadows okay. they were all transparent and that sort of thing, and you could really see out there compared to when I had first gotten out there. So I could actually kind of really see what was going on. Um, so after this flushing stops and that sort of thing, um, you know, everything is just kind of periodically, it just kind of stops for a few minutes, and then the action starts kind of picking up, so to speak. Um, but it, was, it wasn't long after I heard, like, the flushing, I started noticing something. There was this big oak tree that was about 35 yards away from me, and whatever was behind me was no more than about 20 feet away from me. It was just on, like, right beside a trail behind, like... That's pretty close. And, yeah, I mean, I, man, I was just freaking out, even though I'm having a gun. I mean, immediately what was going on in my mind, I thought someone was trying to ambush me. You know, I thought, like, maybe there were some people. I thought maybe they were going to kill me. Sure. All this sort of stuff. Just, I mean, There wasn't, like, a positive thought in my mind. And, I mean, even what was behind me, I was too scared to look. So that... Sure, so at this at this point, you didn't think it's any kind of animal. You're thinking it was. People. I thought it was people like the entire time. I mean, I just couldn't think of anything else that walked on two legs or had hands to snap anything or, you know, bang. Right, other yeah. than people. And um, there was a big oak tree in front of me. And then, like, at first on the right side of it, I thought I'd see something kind of like uh, maneuver behind the tree that's, like, black. And at first I kind of thought, okay, well, maybe this is like a shadow is just kind of flickering off of some something else. And um, I see this about two or three more times, you know, something moving on the right side of the tree. It just, it, briefly, it would just kind of, like, you would see the movement of something on the right side of the tree. Okay, so then I started focusing on the tree, and I'm like, you know, I'm telling myself, I'm like, am I seeing this? I'm like, is this a shadow? What's, you know, what's going on out here? And it's especially hard seeing in that twilight time where it's not quite daylight and it's not quite nighttime. Mm -hmm. So it's real difficult to see during those time periods. Yeah, I mean, anything could be playing a trick on your mind. Just the way the light, the, the light kind of plays off of everything. You know what I mean? Like if the winds kind of, absolutely. You know, like the way the trees can move. Oh God, it's Freddy Krueger over there behind the tree. You know? <laughs> right. Hopefully, Hopefully not. not. You know. Well, at least Freddy, he's not real. You know. <laughs> this is true. But um, so so what so what happens? At I started point? just fixating myself on this particular spot behind the tree. And I noticed that, like, eventually what happens on the left side of the tree, I see something peeping around the back of this tree, and I'm like, holy hell, you know, what is that? And I started noticing that whatever it is, it's taller than a human being. And it was under eight feet tall, but, I mean, for that particular age, and, you know, I've seen some tall people, it was, it was like, taller than any basketball player that you would have seen in person, you know? And, then that, and, and it's getting more light all the time, so you're able to see more clearly as each moment goes yeah. by, right? Yeah, all right. So I don't know if you can see me, but I see, like just say if this is the tree, I see something like tilting his head. And I can just see this very angry, what I describe as a very, very angry eyeball just looking at me. just, And I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God, what is that? And I mean, like, upon the first thing I'm seeing, you know, um, I guess you're trying to tell yourself, oh, my God, is this like a monster, you know? But I mean... What I was seeing, you could instantly tell it was not someone in a costume. That it wasn't something, some, something, somebody had put together to go out in the woods and scare somebody. I realized that what I was seeing was something real. Um, so upon seeing this thing and it was looking at me just all angry, I guess I was just mesmerized and I just kind of locked eyes with it for a minute. And basically what I could see would have been like about this part of the head. Like I could see like the, the conical shape of a head. I could kind of see a cheek. I could see an angry eye. I remember like the, the facial features. Only one when I could see there was like a deep set wrinkle that was coming from um, the corner of the eye, kind of going down the face. And you know, I just I'm I guess I'm just trying to figure out what it is. And I started hearing the brush behind me moving really quickly, like someone's actually trying to break through it. 
and it just sounded like whatever was kind of coming through the brush was hung up, like it was caught up in some kind of like just thick vines, and it just couldn't get through it. So now, is that the one that what you heard off the second one, or is this? This a is these one? are actually the same ones, and so okay, the, the second. Yeah, so like the one behind me. Um, I mean, by this point in time, I mean it was just merely torturing enough. You know, I, I was like, okay, I don't care anymore. I was in this tree. I guess it was about fourteen feet tall. And um, it was like a younger tree, so the deer stand was about 12 feet up in the air. So, like, it was a Y-shaped tree. So, like, the base of the tree would have just been a little bit over my head. So when that thing started breaking through, I wasn't going to sit there and, and find out what was about to happen to me. I couldn't stand it anymore, man. I, I absolutely stood up on the back of that stand, and I balanced myself against the tree, you know, is, is the best I could. And so when I first turned, everything happens really quickly, but I had the gun on whatever the movement was in the bush. So I absolutely couldn't see what it was. I mean, you could just see the bush moving like something's coming through it, and I had the rifle on it, and something in my mind just told me, just, I just lowered the rifle and ended up firing a shot right in front of it. Now, when I fired the mm -hmm. shot off, I, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I've said this before, but there, there was four things that actually ran away. And, I mean, they, they completely hauled ass, man. I mean, like, there, and then, like, there was one, the first one I hear run was one I didn't know was there. It would have been, like, behind the one behind me just a few so you were only aware of two of them. I'm sorry, I didn't okay. mean to interrupt. But there, you you knew of two, but there were actually two other ones there. Also. Well, there was there was the one that was walking towards me, and then there would have been the one that was behind the tree. Now, what was weird about it is, it, even though it was kind of dark, I never saw anything sneak up on, that would have gotten behind that tree. Um, there, there was kind of like a little eroded kind of a gully that was like between like right in front of that tree and stuff like that. And I guess it would have been about eight feet deep. And then there was like a ditch that was right there in that tree line and stuff. And so like then it was nothing but open field in the clearing. So I could see everything perfectly there. And I would have been able to see something sneaking up on me. So what I got to thinking was is that creature must have been behind the tree the whole time that I was there. And it didn't make a move or anything until like it finally decided to show itself. And I'm Almost like it was it had been an ambush. Yeah, to begin with. and I don't know if maybe I got lucky and we just got dropped off at the you know like the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know if maybe they must have been hunting there and they didn't expect us to come up or expect some people to come up. Right. But when I fire the shot off, what's weird is I hear four creatures run away. Now the two in front of me, I mean it was basically four of them around me that I was aware of. Okay, so like the two behind me, they hauled ass, and the, the two in front of me, they haul ass too. So after I fired the shot, I turned, and then that's when I see, like, the one that was behind the tree actually running away. And, um, you know, like, I've seen quite a, a few. I've seen about seven creatures in my life, and each one of them had been different, but that one, it was under eight feet tall. And, it, it, like, I'll describe it as being, you know, it was stocky and what people kind of refer to as being kind of a tree trunk shape, but it didn't have, like, it didn't sure. have, like any kind of muscular form to it at all. I mean, it, it just didn't have, like, any kind of shape you know what I mean? Maybe we got the impression it was an old female or something like that. And I'm not sure to this day if it was a male or a female. Um, but I remember, like, when that sucker ran in the open, you know, like the daylighting conditions, I could see, like, the waves and the hair of it. Um, the thing I remember seeing the most, I saw the bottom of its left foot, and it had this white foot. Okay, so right when it got right. to where, like, about the edge of the wood lines, it just came to this brief view. It, like kind of leaned on its right foot and it pushed off of it and turned very sharply ran into the woods so the two in front of me when they got up you know like a good little ways away they actually started cr calling like crows like caw 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 I know people laugh when I do that but it sounded like people were doing it, it didn't sound like like a bird at all bad imitation yeah. and um so like the woods man like when these creatures were running through the woods man it sounded like rice krispies it was just snap crack one pop everywhere and so I had to wait on my dad to come get me. And it took him at least five minutes to show up. And he wasn't very far away. But, you know, like, the whole time all this stuff was going down, when I first started hearing a creature walking towards me, I wanted to get down and run. And that was the first thing I was thinking about in my mind. Everything is telling me, don't get down. Stay where you are. And it was probably a good thing you I did. I know, you know. And then there's people that get angry at me because I fired a shot at the, one of these creatures, you know. And... You know, like, I don't judge people who think these creatures are all good, you know, but I have people that just absolutely, they just don't have a, a nice feeling about me because of this encounter, but they weren't, they weren't. Well, different. let me, let me tell you, I think a lot of people that, that think that way have never experienced these creatures. 
when you have a firsthand experience like that, it changes your outlook completely. Oh, it does. I mean, I, I really had chopped it up to being maybe like when, you know, like this is my first encounter and after it happened, I thought to myself, well, maybe this was because I wasn't like in the deep woods, you know, and it was something I didn't talk about for years. I didn't tell my family about it. Um, like, you know, like later on when my dad showed up and stuff. I mean, I was like so scared when he finally came up. I mean, he was kind of angry at me because he, he comes up to, you know, and I didn't have a deer or anything like that, and he had to leave his spot. And the only thing I could get out of my mouth, it was like there were people out there, you know? I, yeah, I couldn't say right. monster. I mean, I couldn't hardly get words out of him. I'm like, there's people out here. And I said, they were trying to get me. And of course, he's like, well, there's, there's nobody out here. And so I still felt like we were being watched. And I think that there might have been another one around that we just didn't see because they don't always run from guns like people think they do. They were Sure, and, and possibly they didn't go that far. That too. I mean, like, eventually you didn't hear them running in the woods anymore. I mean, but otherwise, when they were first running, you could hear them just going through, like, limbs and stuff like that, man. It was just... It was the most mentally torturing thing that I'd ever been through. And I don't know how many of them were out there, but I'm assuming that there would have been one that was doing the knocking across the field. There were, the there were the two in right. front of me. There were two behind me. And there was probably another one around that just wasn't scared, that just, just was hanging around and just watching me still. Sure. Yeah, and we, I've heard that many times, many accounts, you know, where people are surrounded and and uh, usually one in control, which it's, it's possible the one that was doing the making the noise initially, uh, you know, could have been the alpha, the one in charge, you know, and that was the signal basically to begin mm -hmm. the hunt. Uh, did you ever have any thoughts about what would have happened had you not fired? Uh, you know, I honestly, uh, in knowing how tall some of these creatures are, I mean, even though I was 12 feet up, I mean, they could have grabbed me easily, you know, and then like. A lot of people try to humanize these creatures, and in my experience with them, they're they're nothing but something wild, you know what I mean? Exactly. I, I and I mean, it's agree. like a white shark or it's like a grizzly bear. Um, you know, they're not something that like we can. They're not like exotic pets like people think they are. You know? And, and, and no, and you're exactly right. And I, and I can think of a couple of cases where, like you mentioned, grizzlies. There was the guy and his girlfriend up in Alaska who was. You know, yeah, that guy to, Timothy. I can't remember his last name. Yeah, right. That he had he had all these ideas about grizzlies, and they ended up eating him and his girlfriend. And just recently, in Florida, there was a, a, a tiger handler who called herself, you know, the Tiger Whisperer, and she was mauled to death by a tiger. So, you know, when when you're dealing with wild creatures, uh, you always have to keep in mind they are not absolutely not our friends. They're they're not. These aren't human. We can't place human, you know, attributes on on wild creatures. Well, so, uh, and again, it's speculation. Of course, we can we can speculate what they were up to or what they would have done. But sometimes it's interesting to speculate. Well, another thing, I, like a lot of people tend to put these creatures on a pedestal, and they don't have us on a pedestal like we do them. You know, <laughs> no. they really don't. And like, uh, you know, like I've seen basically what we call the patty types and stuff like that. And I think sometimes they, they might be a little bit more intelligent than some of these other species, you know. Like, I do know, I know here in particular we have some that looked a little bit more orangutanish. And then we. Yeah, you've got, you've got the type twos a lot, mostly. Mm -hmm. the and then we have. And they're definitely more aggressive. Yeah, and you know, things like that. And I think, like, maybe those particular things, whereas, like, the, the patty types might be a bit more human not, humanoid and, and a little bit more human in terms of how their mind works, I think, like, these creatures that tend to be more primate looking really are a lot more animalistic, despite the fact that they still have yeah. a lot of the same intelligence, and their intelligence tends to be very parallel in terms of hiding and that sort of thing. But, you know, later on that day, we went back to camp and stuff. I didn't go back out in the woods. Like, when the family was gone, I guarded the door with my gun and that sort of thing. Um, we left, like, the next, the, the, the following day, like, early in the afternoon. And then it was something I didn't talk about for years, you know. And um, I started studying on, like, the subject then. But, like, you know, we didn't have the Internet like we do now. So we don't have, like, all these resources. So then I would go to the library and I would get books and stuff like that. But it would always be like the same, you know, four and five stories, you know. Uh, yeah, there wasn't much information out, you know, up until the advent. Yeah, of the like Internet. the guy in British Columbia that supposedly was in a sleeping bag and he got carried away. I mean, I read that story so many mm -hmm. times, you know. And then, like, you just, I, just for me, I kind of became frustrated because I had never read any kind of stories that were any like anything that had happened to me. In most cases, like, people talk about, oh, they're shy, and they won't bother you, and they run away from you, and that's... 
It was, <laughs> yeah, it was better. nothing like that at all for me. And, you know, like, then I had my second encounter, which was in October of 97, and it was just something that was just so unexpected. But, you know, like, after I had my encounter, that's when I really started getting um, more and more into this subject and actually learning more about it. And What happened during okay, that? Okay, it was basically what it was. I was 18 years old. I got in my first car. Okay, so then, like, to pay for my first car, I actually had, like, an after-school job. Um, so, like, it was basically, like, the Thursday before Halloween and that sort of thing. And the whole time I had the car, I really not gotten to drive it or anything. I either had to go to school or I had to go to work or something like that. So my mom back then, she was really cool. She wasn't strict with us or anything like that. And I was, like, really a good kid. Like, man, I, like, I've never gotten in trouble. I've never been arrested. I live a drug and alcohol-free lifestyle even now. I mean, like... So I'm, I just never was one of these kids that went out and got in trouble or anything like that. So mom was pretty lenient with me. Like if I wanted to go out, um, as long as I was home at like a reasonable time, I didn't stay out to 3 a.m., she really didn't care. But the fact was I was 18 years old, you know what I mean? So she didn't treat me like I was like a bait. Okay, so now okay. Oh, my phone's going to ring. <laughs> go, okay. go ahead and continue. So um, basically what it was is one night I had to work, I decided that I was going to leave the house. And what it was, I was going to get a pack of cigarettes. So then, like, that is one bad habit that I have is cigarette smoking. So I drove to a gas station that was about five miles away to, from my home. And upon, like, going and paying for my gas, I got in the car and I had, like, a full tank of gas. I was like, man, you know, I really don't want to go home yet. And honestly, I just wanted to smoke a few cigarettes because if I would have just gone straight home, I would have been able to smoke one cigarette. You know, like, I don't know if you've ever smoked or anything, but, like, when you're no good, be glad. You know, it's, it's awful. <laughs> but, like, you know, like, when you're young and your parents don't know, you're trying to sneak, you know, and, like, uh, you have, like, one cigarette, then you're dying for, like, six and eight hours. Oh, God, the parents are here, and I can't smoke a cigarette, you know? So I decided that, like, since I was so close to actually one of the lakes, um, what I would do is, like, I would just go up to the lake, drive around, and I would smoke about three cigarettes, and I would come home and go to bed because I had school the next day. Um, so, like, this particular area is an area I've been going to my entire life. Um Basically, you take a road that goes up to, like, the lake. We have what we call the spillway. Um, so, like, uh, it's basically the highest elevation of that lake. So, like, upon driving there, um, when you get to, like, basically the end of, like, where the road would be. I'm, I'm really just trying not to be too descriptive because there are people that say, let's go out there and go researching, you know. And um, so, like, basically I get up to where the lake is and I just kind of watch the lake. There was no cars out or anything like that, no traffic. Um so I watched the lake for a few minutes. I decided, okay, I'm going to smoke one more cigarette. So I decided I was going to turn, and there was like a gravel road that's like not too far away from there. And um, basically what it is, it would have just been one long circle. I would have been uh, gone down this road that starts off as a gravel road. It turned to pavement. I would have been in like kind of a rural area where there were a lot of houses that were very close to each other. And then I would have come basically, when I got to the end of the road, I would have came right back to where I started and gone straight home. So it had been like a 15-minute just a loop, so to speak. Okay, so what it was that night, it was like, it was kind of cool because it was during like October. So we, we had a little bit of moisture out that night. And the road, when I first pulled onto it, is gravel. And it's barely big enough for two cars. And um, so like I started going down the road and you're going down like a downhill elevation and that sort of thing. So right before you get to like the bottom of like where the um, hill is, there's this real sharp kind of a snaky curve and that sort of thing. And then you come out to where there's two fields. And um, I can't remember really what. I just I remember maybe one was a cotton field or a soybean field. I can't really remember what was growing in them or that sort of thing. But I'm assuming it would have been something that would have tracked deer to been out there eating, you know. Sure. Okay, so, like, as I got around, like, the, the snaky part of the curve, like, when I got to, like, where, where the middle of that curve is, I noticed, like, I was, like, focusing on my stereo, so I had my head and I'm looking straight, but my eyes are, like, actually on the stereo. I noticed, like, a yellow eye glow that's, like, not too far away down the hill. And um, I guess what was weird about it was I, mean, I immediately thought it was an owl. And even after my first in encounter, I never thought I would see anything like that again. And what threw me off right. about the eye glow, even though I only saw it for like a mere second or two, is it was two forward-facing eyes, you know? And you start mm -hmm. thinking, well, what has two forward-facing eyes that could be out at night in a tree? And, and that's, I don't think, oh, it's a hoot owl, you know? So I didn't, yeah. like, slam on the brakes or anything. I just kind of slowed down. I yielded to a stop in case it was, like, going to be a deer or something was going to run out and hit my car. 
And right as I'm like just coming to a yield, it was a, a, like a creature that was been behind this sh short tree. It was probably about a little over six feet tall. And um, I guess how the creature would have been like behind the tree, it would have kind of had like its back or its kind of side to me. And it's kind of like bending down, just kind of hiding behind the tree. And I, I don't know why right. to this day it, this creature did what it did. But this creature, when it walked out, it was it was a big black male Sasquatch. But when it walks out, it walked out, and I don't know if you can see me in the video, but it takes one step from the side of the road, and it's just like, it takes one step, and it's like walking out on its hands, like it's actually going to fall down and start walking on its hands or something like that. So when it gets right. out to about where the center of the road is, it just it just changed course, and it didn't stand up fully erect, but it just basically went to go in standing. All right, so like upon mm -hmm. like this creature being in the road, it kept its side to me and stuff, and I don't know why I wasn't scared, um, and for some reason I just wanted to look at it, um, because like when I when I saw the first creature, man, I mean like for years I never got to see what the face looked like. I just saw it running away, and I I, just, I guess I was just kind of caught in the moment. I just wanted to look at what this thing was, and so like I'm kind of like at a downhill elevation, and the, and the creature wasn't, but like a few feet away from the front of my car, and so like the headlights are beaming through like the waist area, and so the top of it is actually silhouetted. So after like a few moments, you know, my eyes kind of adjusted. I could actually see the creature really well. Um, so like I would describe this creature, you know, like compared to like some of the other ones I've seen, it looked it typically more like some of the ones you see in the Northwest where it was just really bulky and really built. And it was right. a little over eight feet tall. But what was weird about it, it was it was really mangy looking, honestly. Um, it had hair missing mm -hmm. on it in places, like like where the side was facing me. I could see like it had hair missing on its leg, and it had it had like dried sure. dirt on it, like it had slid down some embankment. So like the, the dirt, it wasn't it was dry looking, like it just like if you've ever seen a dog go and roll in dirt, and after a few moments, how the dirt kind of dries right. on it. Right. <laughs> and so then, like on its chest, I noticed that it had like some uneven uh, patches of hair missing and stuff. So like the skin that I could actually see it was exposed, kind of had like this ashy kind of look to it. And this guy, right. man, he was really built and really muscular looking. I mean, out of all the ones I've seen, like some tall ones and stuff, man, but this guy was just really built. I mean, it was like the classic example of what one of these things actually looks like in terms of a build. So it kept its side to me and stuff, and I, and I watched it about, for about the first minute, and it was watching me. And I guess it's like the, the seconds were going by, I started getting more scared. Um, because, man, when this thing was looking at me, I mean, it just kind of looked at me like I was a germ. And it just kind of had this sneery kind of a look on its face, and I could see it breathing into the night. I could, When it would breathe, I could see that it was taking these slow breaths, and I could see it breathing into the night. And I expected this creature ultimately was just going to go across the road and go on about its merry way. I didn't know what I did. It was just going to stand there like that. So, um, you know, me and this thing are just watching each other, I guess. And you could tell that this thing knew what a car was. I mean, you could tell that it, it understood, you know, like to look in the windshield that there would be like a person in there, if that makes sense. And so, like, it was looking at me through like the windshield and that sort of thing. I don't know if it was just thinking or figuring something out, you know, I didn't know like if it was just trying to get a look at me or just go on its way or what. So like the creature is keeping its side to me the whole time, you know, and then like I noticed that, like it was keep it was kind of turning its torso to kind of look at me. Okay, yeah. so then I guess I start taking in, oh God, what I, what I'm what I'm seeing here and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like yeah. now what do you do? And you know, like the second when this thing wasn't moving after about a minute, I'm like, oh god, it's it's not going to move. And then I realized that if I would have had to go, by, you know, if I had to go back around the road, I would have had to go around this really sharp curve and stuff. Well, it was in that minute that like the creature's demeanor just started changing, and it was just, it just started kind of jerking and swaying more, like he he was just I don't know, it was. It was swaying. Yeah, I mean, like, it kept its side to me. And it, it was, like, I don't know if you can see me, but it's just kind of moving, kind of... No, I can't see, actually. Uh, you have to okay, so, it. like, um, I mean, like, the whole time it was standing in front of me, it was kind of moving. It had its torso kind of turned, looking at me and stuff, and it was kind of just slowly moving. It wasn't moving like I'm a violent animal or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And you didn't feel very threatened. But its demeanor was changing, whereas the sways, it was just kind of jerky, like, um... Like I don't know, like I'm I'm getting pissed off here for some reason. You know what I mean? It's like, a, was it was it like the way chimps do when they sway back? And it was forth? kind of like that. Like you know, like if you've seen them, like when they're playful and stuff, you know, they just kind of move around. Sure. But it would have been like that, but like an angry version of that. And 
So like the creature yeah. I noticed, like it, it's kind of looking. I noticed it seems like it's kind of looking over the back of my car. I mean, like if you've ever seen someone and it's like in a big crowd and they're they're angrily waiting for somebody, they're kind of you know, sure looking looking over, over everybody. Yeah. And I, and then that just for some reason, man, it was just creeping me out. And I'm like, oh god, I got to get the hell out of here. And so I couldn't think of what to do. I mean, this thing, they're, they're so big, man. They could total a car like it was nothing. I couldn't just, I couldn't drive around the creature. Uh, there were these small ditches right. that if, and if I would have just tried to drive around it for a say, the car would have bottomed out and I would have been stuck. So the only thing I could think to do was hit the bright lights in hopes that it would actually move. And so I pulled back the bright lights on the car and it hit it in the face. Okay, so when they hit it in the face, it just, <gasps> it just made this like angry <gasps> type sound. So when I hit it in the face, it, I could see the teeth of it and stuff like that. Um, it made it, I heard it make this almost like a cough kind of a sound. <gasps> and when it did that, it was like it was taking its breath in, and then this thing started screaming at me. Okay, and the scream, I, would I mean, I don't want to do it because I don't want to sound silly, but I would describe it as being very operatic. It started off being like very, very low, and then like it goes from like this very low tone to like being a very high tone. So what was weird is when that sound hits me, man, I cannot move. I mean, like, I, you know, I've heard they had this infrared type thing that they can do. And when that high-pitched sound hits me, man, I mean, I absolutely could not move. I mean, I felt completely paralyzed. I couldn't move my arms. I couldn't move my legs. And it was like being fully conscious and not being able to move, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, the creature, when it, when it, it finally turns and it's like standing straight in front of me and that sort of thing, and it actually moves close to the car when it's like screaming at me. It was just taking these small, these breaks, but it didn't sound like, in other words, it was catching its breath. I mean, it just ultimately sounded like when it yeah. took that one deep breath, it had enough wind in its lungs to keep on screaming. So, like, I guess mm -hmm. what kind of, um, it kind of took like a pause break from the screaming and the, the leg of it actually bumped the front of the car. And so his hands were actually reaching for the windshield. And that's when I felt like, you know, my body felt like it just kind of came back to life. And then I threw the car in reverse. So, like, when the creature actually stepped forward, it got over to the side of the road enough I was actually able to drive around it. And when I drove around it, when we got, um, I was basically just a few yards away from where the road went from gravel to being like a paved road. And when I got to the top of that road and I was under the first street light, you know, I, I stopped and I actually looked out the window to make sure I was still seeing this thing. And it was there and it was still screaming bloody murder. And it had its arms in the air just shaking them like, like crazy. When it was looking over the car, did you get the impression that maybe it was looking for another? I did like actually. It? I mean, you know, like I, when when everything was first going on, I wasn't really. I was just really focused on what was happening in front of me at the time. But after after the fact, yeah, I most definitely thinking about. You know, and I've heard I heard a story in Arkansas where some creatures actually did this to somebody before, where they've actually blocked people's cars and that sort of thing. And then you have another one come up, and that person comes up missing, and they find the car pushed over to the side of the road. Oh, yeah. It's it's actually in a lot more places than you think. It's one of those type of stories that doesn't get a lot of circulation, but I've actually heard of, of a number of these. And, items. you know, after the fact, after this happened to me and stuff, that particular night, there was actually some ladies. There was a church that was just not too far away at all from where I was, and some other ladies had heard that creature screaming that particular night. And, of course, I drove home, and I probably drove home about 120 miles an hour, you know, and... <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. And then I remember, like, when I walked in the house, you know, I immediately went and I grabbed my mom. I, I probably picked her up and put her over my shoulder, and I took her to my room. And I was like, I, I saw this thing, and it was hairy. It was big and hairy. And that's all I could get out. And after a few minutes or so, you know, that's when I, I told her what I, I'd actually seen, and I told her about my first encounter. So until then, I had never actually talked about that to her or anyone, you know. Was she receptive? Oh yeah, she believed her? me, man. I mean, she'd never seen me in in that kind of a state, you know. I mean, I, I mean, it was really just being in shock, you know. Yeah, I can well imagine. And mom was really cool because the next day I got to stay home from school, and we went out to the actual area where that had actually happened the next day, right? So I got like a friend to go with me. I didn't tell him exactly what had happened to me, and I was like, "Hey, man, will you ride out to this spot with me?" So where that creature had actually kind of come out in the road, there had been this tree. And we noticed that, like, um, there was this limb that had been snapped off one of the trees that was pretty high up, and it had been placed on the side of the road where that creature had actually crossed. 
Oh, wow. And then it was years, you know, as time went by, I found out there were there, there's encounters in this particular area just for years and just going back, you know, I guess since, like, there, people have been inhibiting that particular area, you know, and I found out I wasn't the only person that had, like, you know, basically an encounter with these creatures that, you know, involved them chasing or coming up on a car in that type of area. Yeah, it's, it is something that's a lot more common. I know there's one particular area that um, uh, one of my sources that I call Mr. Black was telling me about there's a particular roadway. Um, I won't say what that is to, to give away the location, but he was telling me that uh, one of the most recent accounts was a, uh, a car that was stopped along this road. Uh, there was some damage to the car. The woman was missing, purse and everything, car still running, and Bigfoot tracks wow. next to the car. And and she was never found. So that kind of thing does occur, you know, whether people thinks it does or not. Well, does. I had some friends that actually lived down this road and stuff. And, you know, like, you know, we're kind of a small community here. So back then, everybody kind of knew everybody, or you kind of knew somebody that lived in one of the areas one way or the other, you know, because we all went to school together. You know, everybody kind of knew everybody here. And I had a, a sure. lady friend, you know, like we would have been like uh, in our teens back then. But when she was like really young, she used to encounter these creatures. Now, the ones that she see, would see were the ones that looked more primate looking. And it wasn't until after I did like the Sasquatch Chronicle show that I actually finally caught up with her, you know, like on Facebook and that sort of thing. And when I finally caught her, you know, I was dying to ask her. I finally had to ask her about some of her actual encounters. And she told me that, like, some of the creatures that she used to see, um, what it was is she had um, her mom and she had, like, someone else that lived very close together in that same particular vicinity. And uh, she told me, like, one particular time um, she was actually walking from one spot to the other. And she said that she knows she referred to them as big monkeys. You know, I don't I don't know if she knew what a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot was or anything like that. But um, what she just told me, she said she would say, well, there was this big monkey. She said it was just a little over five feet tall. She said it was standing in the wood line and had his back to her. Now, you know, like some of them have, like, the way their eyes are, man, they tend to be a little bit further back. So I think they have a, a better um, peripheral vision than, say, we do. And so right. I've noticed that these, these, tend to, these, these, con these encounters like that, it's almost like a setup, so to speak. It's like they're basically, it's like an ambush technique when, when they... Much, much more often than people think. See, years ago, it used to be, like you, you brought up earlier, uh, the original pioneers of the subject, when they would collect stories, they thought they were just shy. They, they had this, this particular, uh, or this set of particular behaviors that they attributed to what they called real stories, and then anything outside of that, they simply didn't believe or they wrote mm -hmm. off as nonsense. And today... What I found through, you know, talking with thousands of witnesses over the years is your encounter is much more uh, common than, you know, they're not, these things, in other words, these things, when, when they're seen by people, it's not an accident. It's, it's usually not a chance encounter. There's something going on. You know, and most often we just don't know what the bigger picture is. Oh, who's to say? But I've learned, you know, like when when these suckers are coming out to where you can see them, that's when you need to start looking over your shoulder. They're they're not doing it for no reason, you know. Right, absolutely. There's more going on than. And you um, you know, so that and you know, like she told me quite a, a few things about some of the encounters she had. She told me on this particular day she saw what she described as being a big monkey was kind of, you know, standing out in the wood line and stuff. And she said she was focused on it, and then she started hearing something growling. So she would have been walking along like a uh, driveway that had a barbed wire fence, and then it would have been like a gravel road that was just a general road in that vicinity. She said that there was a creature that was standing on the gravel road not too far away from her, and it was growling at her. Now, she told me, like, um, the creatures that she would see look more orangutanish, orangutanish, if you will, and they look more primate-looking. Because I've, I've showed her pictures of Patty, and I've showed her like, some pictures of these other creatures, and she's like, no, what I saw didn't look like that. Now, the creature, she told me that the, the, the one that was actually growling at her was actually seen by more than one person before. And she said that the, the reason people kind of knew that one was because it was grizzled. In other words, it was kind of a um, kind of a beige, kind of a deer yeah. kind of color, like a brown, but it had also like gray hair and that right. sort of thing. <clears throat> right, kind of an older yeah. looking Yeah, and individual so maybe. then, um, you know, like, I, as time went by, I got to where I would meet more and more witnesses from my area, just say, like, from, like, the late 90s up until, like, the past few years ago, and even, like, last year, I had, like, someone tell me about an encounter in this particular area, 
And that particular area, man, it's just it's it's people have been having encounters there for years. And when I found out I wasn't like the only one something like that happened to, and, and especially in like when it's in the same area, you don't feel so bad, you know. Right, and I think a lot of times, and I know from my own experience, um, you sort of feel alone until there's. And I was lucky because I was able, I had friends, you know, who'd seen tracks and things along with with, you know, the encounters that I had. But uh, uh, you know, when you when you start talking to other people that ha- have had very similar encounters, then you you kind of realize, I guess, internally that hey, I'm not alone. This I'm not crazy. This is this is really going on well you know kind of going into like you know like if we just kind of go like into like the present day you know like and just me knowing more about them now these creatures are really all over these kind of areas man and then like what's weird about it is is they're they're not in the deep forest like people think they are they're not like in the deep set country they're just like on the verge of town you know well they're they're kind of all over but see the thing is what the reason they're close to to humans is we're um we're we're meals of opportunity you know what i mean especially you know we leave a lot of food sources out especially for pets and livestock so uh and and i hate to say it but the occasional you know they they have been known to go after children and and domestic animals as well as you know farm livestock and things like that so but again you know we leave a lot of things out we're very sloppy as as a species today so uh, and it's not just these creatures. Of course, lots of wild animals. You, know, you hear about coyotes coming closer and closer to human populations all the time. And it's because... <laughs> there goes my phone again. And it's because, um, you know, these uh, animals know that we leave things laying around and they can come in and get a meal, you know, on, on the evening. And, you know, a lot of people think that they're hard workers, but they'll be lazy if they can. You know, they know... Oh, absolutely. Every animal out there will take a, a meal of opportunity before going out and doing a lot of work, expending a lot mm-hmm. of energy to get a meal. They will. They know where there's people, there's food. Absolutely. And like you mentioned the first time, you know, I think in Wyoming is where they're having the real problem now with hunters and grizzlies. Uh, you know, when they when they take a shot at a deer or an elk or something, you know, the grizzlies come running towards the gunshot because mm-hmm. they know there's a meal. Animals are smarter than people give them credit for. Yeah. They're very, very smart. They pick up on on these opportunities. It's all about survival. I mean, whatever works easiest. Survival is not about working hard. It's about working. And with smart. these creatures, man, I'm I'm not sure what they are. You know, just like so many other people. But it's almost like they're they're much smarter than just like a regular everyday primate is. And you know, like primates are not dumb at all. You know. Well, all primates are the smartest animals on the planet. I know a lot of people like to compare you know dolphins and elephants and things like that but they are nowhere near the primate level when it comes on the intelligence scale and and of course we don't know where these things fit into the primate you know lineage or or, you know or species but being primates they're going to be far more intelligent than any other animals almost definitely like gorillas and stuff you know people don't realize how closely linked we are to a gorilla i believe those are about like 98.5 percent human or something like that it's it's a it's a high percentage, but you know that other two percent, same with chimps, is is a, is a lot mm-hmm. of differences. So, um, but again, you know that's that's all something that science will figure out down the road. Uh, we're right up. We're just gone okay. over the hour mark. Uh, I know you oh, have yeah. more to tell. Uh, can we can we schedule? Oh yeah, man, I'd be more than happy. I'd be more than happy to do that. You know and. Okay, I, I'm trying to keep these yeah. kind of at the same time frame, roughly, and then. But you have some really great, interesting things to talk about, and I'd love to have you. That would be awesome, again. man. You know, if you have any more questions, I'm actually just trying to give you like the brief rundown of everything, you know, and just kind of leave like open spaces, like if you have any questions and stuff. Because sure. being from the south, it's easy for me to be long winded, you know. <laughs> oh, and that's no problem. And, and like I, I tell people, there's no such thing as too much detail because we pick a lot of. Uh, we pick a lot of things up that are very important that are oftentimes very small details. And, uh, yeah, so, like, even next year, you know, like, this next coming up fall, I'll actually help to go and actually go back out in the woods and actually do some more research. But my thing is this. I'm actually, I mean, I'll admit it. I'm kind of scared to go out in the woods, you know, and it's like it really comes down to that first encounter I had where, like, you know, I got surrounded by a group. You know, and it's like, I don't yeah. ever want to be out in the woods and have something like that happen to me again, you know? And then I don't believe in just going out and hurting these creatures for no reason or anything for that matter. But Right. And I, I don't yeah. think any of us really are. But, um, and of course, being, you're, you're part of the Jebbing Research Group now, so 
uh, you know, we'll put you, lock you in with a team, you know, so you don't have to go alone. And, uh, you know, with your experience and our other people's experience, will be a Oh, yeah, man. So, like, in, in the next time we talk, like, um, you know, I'll really tell you about, like, you know, some of my family's encounters because, you know, that stuff happened for, like, four years, you know. Like, my aunt bought some property. And, you know, at first nothing happened. And then, like, right when the tail end to when she was getting ready to move, that's when we had basically it was like three creatures. We had two, you know, like we had an adult male and an adult female, and then they had like a little juvenile that I only saw about twice. But it was just these two particular creatures for years, man. And then like um, the more aggressive one out of the two was actually the female. And, you know, my mom, she moved into the place after my aunt left, and my mom got harassed, just basically harassed by this female the whole entire time she lived there, you know. And uh, it was during that right. point in time where I just really learned about them, you know. And then, um, you know, like, I remember telling, like, the BFRO, you know, like, I actually, like, reported my second encounter to those guys, you know. And then, like, I remember contacting them. They really weren't any help, so to speak. And then... They, well, and they never not. are. And it's just <laughs> like, uh, it's just like you see a rattlesnake on the ground, you know. It's like, you know, instead of just making it worse, hey, let's go, let's go poke the snake with a stick and see what it does, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a great teaser for the next time we have you on cue. Let's uh, we'll go ahead and okay. wrap it up for now, and uh, that'll definitely give everyone something. Awesome, man! I like, enjoy talking to you, man. You know, like I feel like I've kind of come full circle. I've done quite a few shows now, so like now, like talking with you, I feel like I've kind of come like full circle. You know, I've come back I've come home, back man. Home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Q. Very well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for for telling everyone your first two encounters and everyone uh q will definitely be back and he has a lot more to tell so uh as we as we continue with the shows be sure to watch for uh when thank you as well will bye-bye all right bye now thanks everyone for joining me this week be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown